What is up, Red Rocks? Oh, you make me feel like I'm at home already. What is going on? How many of you love your pastor? Man, I am so privileged to be here with you tonight. I'm so privileged. Uh, I just want to take a second just to honor your pastor. As she said, we had the privilege of meeting her about a year and a half ago, and it was a little, a, literally answer from God uh, in the life of my wife and, and mine. And uh, we're just so grateful to know your pastors, to know your ministry. And I want you to know this, that they're not just a blessing to this house, but they're a blessing to the houses that are all around this country. That your ministry, it doesn't just, it may happen here physically, but what you're doing and what God is doing in this place is literally echoing across this nation. And so I want you to do me a favor. If you would just turn your attention to Jesse real quick and to John, and on a count of three, I want you to just yell thank you with everything that you have and just show your appreciation to your pastors. Now, you ready? One, two, three. That was good right there. Well, man, it's so good to see you. My name is Steven, and I am from New Orleans, Louisiana. Have any of you ever been to New Orleans? You probably went to Mardi Gras. We're going to talk after this is over. I'm always hesitant about asking that question um, anywhere I go. But anyway, uh, we're from New Orleans, Louisiana. My wife is over here with me, my better half. This is Laura. I think we have a picture of our family. Um, and me and my wife, we have a son. His name is Taj. He's two years old as of next week. Um, that's our little family, and uh, we are just so grateful to be here with you tonight. But here, let me tell you this. Man, ever since I found out that I was going to be here with you, I have ne not stopped praying for you. And I want to just take a second before we dive into the Word of God to, to go ahead and to pray together as a group tonight and you individually. But I want to tell you specifically what I've been praying for you about. The Bible tells us in Proverbs that how good is a timely word? How many need a timely word tonight? Man, I, there's... I love this, that in the Greek, there's two different words for the word word. There's this word that's logos, which means the written word of God. It's what you hold on to. It's the Bible. It's the word of God. And then there's another word in the Greek. It's called rhema. It also means word, but it's a little bit different. It means that a specific word for a specific moment. How many of you know that when you go through a difficult time and someone's like, yeah, I know you're going through something difficult. Don't worry. Jesus loves you. Yeah, you know Jesus loves you, but you need another word. How many of you know tonight that tonight God has a rhema word for you tonight? I don't know what you're going through. I don't know anything about you. I don't really know anything about Denver. All I know is that God is moving here in this place. But I know that Jesse said, I want to echo it. God knew your footsteps were going to lead you into this place because he has something that he wants to tell you tonight. He wants to speak directly into your heart tonight. Not just you here, but those of you who are watching on Facebook Live. Man, God wants to speak to you tonight. I want to encourage you to bow you have me over this place. We're going to pray. And I'm going to pray over you tonight and over our service. But this is what I want you to do. I want you to pray tonight for yourself. And I want you to be honest with God and say, God, whatever it is that you're dealing with, whatever it is that you need from him tonight, if you desire God to speak into your heart tonight, to speak into your life, to give you that rhema word tonight, I want you to tell God that, God, we thank you so much for who you are. God, there is none like you. You are amazing. You are awesome. God, you knit us together in our mother's womb. Father, you know the, the number of hairs on our head, the, the words before we spoke it. You knew we were going to be here tonight, Father. You know the message that you're going to bring forth tonight, God. So tonight, we ask for a rhema word, God. We ask that you would speak directly into our situation, to our life, to our context, Father. And we say, Father, here we are. Speak to us tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody says, amen. amen. Man, you're in the middle of a series right now called Before the Thunder. Are you enjoying the series? Is it awesome? I've been watching. I've been so encouraged by uh, the messages that have been coming forth from here on Thursday night. And tonight, I have the privilege of continuing this message with you. And, and just if this is your first night, uh, basically to sum it up, we're talking about the importance of the moments before the moments. But as I was preparing for tonight, I couldn't help but think that maybe there's some people who think that there isn't a moment for you. That there's no hope for you, that for because of the family situation, because of the academic situation, financial, the mistakes that you've made, that yeah, that's great, that there's, God's got some big plans for some people, he's going to use some people, but maybe you're thinking, well, not me, uh, there's a limit to what God can do with my life, and I kind of know what it is already, and I just want to speak truth over you tonight. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians, it says, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Can I tell you tonight that you cannot fathom God's plans for your life? 
The things that you think in your mind, you're like, oh, God's going to do big things with me. It doesn't even tip the iceberg of what God wants to do in and through you. Now, Drake just came out with a song recently called God's Plan. I don't know if you heard it or not, um, but here's, don't, don't say that. Don't, don't say holler. But here's the deal. He said in his song, he goes, the only thing he loves is his bed and his mama. He's sorry, but here's the deal. This is what I know. God's got more bigger plans for you than Drake ever has for you. God's got bigger plans for you than any song that you're going to sing. God's got so big plans for you. He says that tonight you can't even fathom the plans that he has for your life. He goes on uh, to tell us in John 10, 10, Jesus said this, I've come that they have, met, have life and have it abundantly. Jesus came not so that you can just stand in a worship center and raise your hands and say, yeah, I'm alive, this is great, but then leave this auditorium and go live a normal life, a mundane life. Everything uh, affects you. There's no difference between you and the person to your left and your right in your classroom where you work with. No, Jesus said, so I came to give you life, and I love it, to give you abundant life. And that word abundant is a Greek word, and this is what it means. It means superior, extraordinary, surpassing, and uncommon. Let me tell you something. God's got an extraordinary life planned for you. Extraordinary life planned for you. I don't know what's been spoken over you. I don't know what, what people have told you, maybe, like I said, in your family or in your circumstances. But let me tell you what God says about you tonight. And that he has an abundant life for you, and he has great plans for your life. Can I tell you tonight, that's why you got to read your Bible. You got to read your Bible. Man, if you stop listening right now, and I hope you don't, but you only hear no nothing but right now, man, you go home and you read your Bible for yourself. You have got to be reminded about what God says about you and not be defined about what the world says about you. And in order for you to combat that, you've got to have your eyes and your ears fixated on what God has said about you. You have got to read your Bible. Now, tonight, I just really want to focus in and lean in on one truth. And this is what I want to lean in on, is that we won't experience God's best if we fail to say yes. You will not experience God's best if you fail to say yes. I like to tell people I grew up uh, in a Christian home, but I had a drug problem. My mom always drugged me to church. That's a Christian joke. You can laugh later. But here's the deal. I grew up in a Christian home, went to church my whole life, did this my whole life, was leading worship on the worship stage. But can I tell you, I knew about God, but I didn't know God. I was a senior in high school. I was depressed. I had all the things that this world says, man, if you just get this, then everything's going to be okay. But it was in that moment that I was depressed and suicidal, wanting to take my life. And it was January of my senior year in high school that I decided that I was going to surrender my life to the Lord. I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't know what it looked like. But all I said was this to God. I said, God, I said, if you are who you say you are, you can have me. You can have every area of my life, not just the time when I go to church, the time when I'm in front of certain people. No, no. You can have everything about me. You can have my finances. You can have my relationships. You can have my emotions. You can have every single detail about my life. And it was on that night, January of my senior year, that I gave my life to the Lord. I began to read my Bible and to read about who God was. I had a hunger and thirst for God's word like never before. I'd run home from school and I would sit before God and I would open my Bible and I would just read through the scriptures. And I came to a passage tonight that I want to lean in on. It's in James chapter 5, verses 17. And if you have your Bible tonight or even those notes that were on your seat tonight, it's that first verse there. And it says this. It says that Elijah was a man just like us. Elijah was a man just like us. I said, no way. Who's Elijah? So I began to study about the life of Elijah. And if you don't know anything about this man called Elijah, you can start reading about him in 1 Kings chapter 7. But I just want to tell you a couple things about Elijah tonight. He was a man that God told him to do certain things. God told him to go certain places. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 5, uh, we see that God told him to go somewhere, and so he did what the Lord had commanded him. Specifically, it says this. It says that the word of the Lord came to Elijah, and he directed him to go to uh, a specific region. He said, you're going to drink from a brook, and I've directed the ravens to supply you with food there. This is Uber Eats for the first time. He goes there, and the ravens bring him food. What I love about this in Elijah's life, God says, hey, I want you to go to this place, and there's going to be some birds who are going to bring you some awesome food. What if God told you that tonight? 
Think about it. I want you to go and drive up the mountains, and there's going to be a moose there. <laughs> and he's going to have a bag of McDonald's for you. <laughs> You're like, dude, who are you hanging out with? <laughs> you know what I love about Elijah? Verse 10, so he went. So he went. It doesn't say that, oh, he went to his leaders to see what they thought about what God said. It doesn't say that, oh, he tried to get his Christian friends together to kind of understand what God had said to him personally. There's no yes even. There's just obedience. God said to go, so I'm going to go. Well, it continues in the story. We read about Elijah, and, and as it continues, it says, and God told him to go uh, to a place called Zarephath. And what's the next thing it says in verse 6? So he went to Zarephath. As he gets there, he meets a lady, a widow. She's got a son. There's a famine in the land. And she he tells this lady, he goes, look, I need you to fix me some bread. Give me some water. She does that. God does a miracle in and through that situation. Then this widow's son dies. This widow is so upset at what has taken place. And Elijah goes up to the room where he's at. And long story short, Elijah prays for the boy. And the boy comes and he's raised back to life. There's an obedience, and then there's a miracle. God speaks, Elijah acts. And then it continues. The Bible says that God told Elijah to go talk specifically to Ahab, who was the king at the time. And Ahab was a very wicked man, but the Bible says that Elijah went. Elijah went. And then it comes into this place where I think it's the most craziest thing that happened, one of the craziest things. I mean, you have UFC for the first time, Ultimate Fighting Church takes place. You get all these churches together at the top and all these prophets at the top, and they begin to cry out to their God because there's a famine. And they begin to, to sacrifice certain things, and Elijah's there, and he's just laughing at them. He's like, oh, maybe your God can't hear you. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he went on vacation. You need to scream a little louder. And then Elijah gets up to the table, and it says that he instructs water. He says, hey, I want you to bring me a bunch of barrels of water, and I want you to pour it around this offering. Now, there's a famine, and there's all these things that hadn't rained in a long time, and so to request water was kind of a big deal. But as that took place, and Elijah was walking in obedience to the Lord, the water filled the trough around the altar. He began to cry out to God, and then the most amazing thing happens. The Bible says that fire came down from heaven and took up the water. And took up the sacrifice. You know, I love that because there's something when I read that about water that speaks to me because water is just something that's so natural. It's normal. There's nothing great about it unless you put those little packets of flavoring in it. Then it gets cool. But like, I don't, whatever, right? But here's the deal. God takes the normal and he makes it super normal. He makes it amazing. I don't think that it's a coincidence that the first miracle that Jesus ever did was at a wedding in Cana where he took water and he turned it into wine. I think that there's something that's trying to be spoken to you and I, especially when Jesus said that you as human beings were born of water. It's something that's normal, that everybody is normal, right? We're all in the same thing together. But when it's presented before God as a sacrifice, he does something incredible with that water that only he can do. And I want you to see something about Elijah's life tonight, that Elijah's life was marked with obedience and his life was marked with a yes. I remember sitting there when I'm in high school and I'm reading this. And he's talking about how this guy, Elijah, is a man just like me. And man, it took me forever to wrap my head around that. Because here's the deal. I mean, let's be honest. You grow up, you read the Bible, you read things in church, you hear messages about people, and like you're like, oh, they're awesome, they're spiritual, like they're up here. But here I am, 2018, and I'm down here. Oh, woe is me, I'm sinful, and I'm all these things. Well, in that one scripture, it leveled the plane for me. And I felt like God was saying, it could be for you, Stephen. It could be for you. But here's the ingredients for God to do amazing things in your life. You've got to say yes, and you've got to walk in obedience to him no matter what he says. Whether you like it or whether you don't like it. Whether it makes sense, whether it doesn't make sense. And here's the, the plot twist tonight is that the small things are actually the big things. 
a lot of us are, are thinking that, oh, God, he, we have to do all these amazing things. But the reality is that he's more concerned about what you're doing behind closed doors than anything else. He's more concerned tonight not what you're doing in this place, but what you're doing when you leave here and you go home tonight. He's worried if the things that you hear from his word and are spoken over you that are truth, if you're actually going to obey them and say yes to them, or are you just going to focus on the gatherings? Because if this is it for you, if all it is is a one-night uh, service, if all of it is is a, is a moment of your week and you do absolutely nothing out there, then you're going to be like me before I gave my life to Christ, super confused. And you probably will think, well, God's not real. And God's not who he says he is. Oh, no, he's real, and his eyes look to and fro across the earth for a man or woman whose heart is turned towards him. And he's looking for a man and a woman who will say yes when he speaks to them. Not when they take their time dragging their feet, trying to get convinced that it is God or it's something else. No, when God speaks, you go. When God speaks, you go. I, mean, I graduated from uh, Tulane University in New Orleans with a double major in business administration and marketing. And my whole life, my dream was to go work on Wall Street, make a bunch of money. I want to do this all the time, all the time, right? I want to make a bunch of money. I wanted to buy houses and all these things. I invested uh, four and a half years of my life in college. No, not because I was dumb. But the reason why is because Katrina happened, so just calm down. And so, like, I invested all this time and energy into college, I got the degree, walked across the stage in the New Orleans Superdome with the Katrina class. Man, life was looking up. Life was looking awesome. I had gotten, actually, I graduated in the middle of the recession, the financial recession, and no one was hiring, but I got a job offer. I said, God, you're faithful. I got a job offer at a Fortune 500 company. I went in for an interview, and they walked me to the office that was going to be mine. And it was awesome because there was windows all over. And if you looked at it, you could see the whole city of New Orleans. And it was crazy because the moment that I stepped into the office, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, this is not for you. Now, how confused and mad you got to be in that moment? <laughs> well, like, no, you, that, that is Satan and you get behind me. <laughs> Jesus gave me this job. Name it, claim it, it's mine. Come on, Jesus, right? I got in my car, and I just started weeping. And here's why. Because I knew it was God. I knew it was God. I knew it wasn't emotions. I knew it wasn't Satan. I knew it was God that had spoken that to me. And in my car, I'm just sitting there. I'm like, so then what? <laughs> like, what do I do then? My sister uh, married... Um, a missionary, and they, they became missionaries in Singapore. And I promised my sister after I graduated college I was going to go and I was going to visit my sister in Singapore. And so I did. I got on a plane that summer after graduation. I said, let me just go ahead and take one of those trips after college, right, kind of clear my mind, find myself, whatever, and find what God wants me to do. And so I went to Singapore, and I, I'm there, and we're having an okay time. But we have some friends who are living in India. They're missionaries there. And I thought to myself, man, I'm, I'm never going to go on this side of the world ever again. So I might as well go ahead and visit my friends in India just for a couple days, see what's going on, whatever. So we fly to India and we get there. And I know it's, this sounds so cliche, but man, I got off the plane and my heart broke. My heart broke. I was there for three days and I was flying back to the States. And the whole time in my head, God was just speaking to me, go back, go back. What does that even mean? I got home, I walked into the Fortune 500 company that I was interning about to take a Series 7 so I can st sell and trade stocks and all those things and make a bunch of money. I worked for the vice president of that organization. I walked into his office. He said, hey, how was your trip? I said, I quit. He said, what? I said, what? <laughs> he said, I said, I quit. He said, um, what are you going to do? I said, uh, I think I'm going to move to India. He goes, okay. And I walked out of the office, walked back to my desk. As I'm walking, I'm like, what did you just do? Like, what are you doing? But the whole time I knew, God said, go. God said, go. Had no details. 
Don't know what it looks like, but God said go. So I went. I spent the summer there. I spent three months living with some missionaries. Had a great, amazing time. Experienced the culture. Was able to do some ministry. It was incredible. I came back home. I served in New Orleans. I, I have a ministry there that I was very um, committed to and I still didn't have a job because I felt like God was saying, go back. But the missionaries weren't there anymore. But they had their house there and said, hey, look, I said, is it okay if I just go and like stay in your house? And they're like, yeah, go ahead, go over there. Went out to dinner with uh, some family and uh, it was at that dinner you know, they were about to leave the next day to go to India. Why? I have no idea. I have no idea. I have a degree from a great university. I have opportunities to make a lot of money. But God said to go, so I'm just like, God, I don't get this, but I'm still going to do what you want me to do. I'll go at dinner with my family, and all the questions are, so when are you getting married? When are you getting a house? Anybody got to ask that question before? When you're growing up. That's great that you want to serve Jesus, but when are you going to grow up? When are you going to get a real job? When are you going to get a real life? When are you going to plant roots? Man, it's so hard. My family loves the Lord, honors the Lord. It's one of the hardest times of my life because I felt like I was turning my back on my family. I was turning my back. You know, when God tells you to do something, that doesn't mean that everybody's going to want you to do it. In fact... Jesus said, if they're persecuting me, what are they going to do to you? And so if you ain't being persecuted, you may want to ask the question, who am I walking with? I remember I got on a plane that next day to head to India, not knowing what I was going to do. Head to a third world country by myself. I called this guy I was discipling with tears in my eyes. I said, dude, I'm about to get on this plane, bro. But I'm just going to tell you something before I leave. Following Jesus is hard, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it. So I get off the plane. I'm living in Mumbai at this apartment for some time, and I'm getting really bored, and I'm feeling like I just threw my life away. So why am I here? The ministry there doesn't really want me there. They're not giving me anything to do. I'm not preaching the gospel. I'm not going anywhere. If anything, I'm just sitting here, and I'm being aggravated. I'm thinking to myself, man, did I really hear God's voice? And then inside, I'm like, yes, you heard God's voice. And I'm like, but this doesn't look right. Like, this doesn't feel right. Like, everybody is going to laugh at me. Like, I don't even know what I'm doing here. And then this, this moment came in my mind while I was praying one day, and I felt like I needed to email this guy that I had met in North India. So I, I emailed him. I said, hey, man, I don't know you. You really don't know me. I'm living in, I'm in Mumbai, but I really want to come visit you in North India. Can I come? He wrote me back right away. He said, hey, man, he goes, why don't you come and visit us? We live in this village in North India. He gave me all the information. So I, got, I went and got a plane ticket to this village in North India. And I get on this plane, and there's two stops before I get to this village. And so I get to the first stop in Calcutta, and I'm getting on the second plane, and the lady takes my ticket, and she throws it back at me, and she goes, you can't go. I said, I bought a ticket. I don't know how things work here, but I got a ticket. <laughs> and she said, no, you can't go here. Go see the police. And I said, I didn't do nothing. Like, what? <laughs> she said, officers, come over here. So they come and get me, and they bring me to this room in this airport. I'm thinking... I'm done. Like, I'm going to be beheaded. I'm going to be on YouTube. Like, ain't nobody know where I'm at. I don't even have a cell phone. I can't text nobody. Nobody knows what to look for. Is that his head? I don't know. Like, nobody knows. So I'm in this room at this airport in Calcutta by myself with this, this police officer, and he just begins grilling me. What are you doing? Why are you going there? What are you doing over there? Who are you going to visit? And here's the deal. Like, I don't really know any of these answers. <laughs> And what you don't want to say is, well, because God told me to go in a nation that does not want God there, right? Like, well, sir, I just want to respect your religion, but my God told me he needed to be. Like, no, we're not doing that, okay? I'm like, dude, like, I'm going to visit some friends, I guess, whatever. He's like, well, I'm going to call this phone number, and if he doesn't answer, then I don't know what we're going to do with you. Calls the phone. My friend picks up on the first ring. He says, yeah, I expect him to be here. But the police officer says, fine, we're going to let you go. But when you get there, you need some paperwork back. I was like, I ain't sending nothing back. I ain't going to see you again. Like, all right, thank you, Jesus. I get on a plane. I pat myself on the back. I said, I got a testimony. He was persecuted. What's up? <laughs> That'll preach. <laughs> I got off the plane in this village. And the army was waiting at the airport. And they escorted me from the plane <laughs> to another office. And I was like, this is getting ridiculous. And I'm there, and the guy's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I, 
I'm here to see a friend. He goes, who's your friend? And I was like, I had the guy's name. He's like, where does he live? I was like, he he lives here. Like, I don't know. He said, um, he goes, all right, well, we're going to have to take you to jail. I said, dog, I didn't do nothing. Like, <laughs> I, didn't, I was quiet. I was like, okay. Like, I mean, what do you say in that situation? Like, no, no, I'm not ready. No, like, what do you say? <laughs> right? So they escort me from the airport, and they bring me to, this, to their police station in their jail. I'm sitting in this office, and there's this guy who I've only met once. I don't know nothing about this dude, man. He's either, I don't know if he's a Christian. I don't know if he's a Hindu. I don't know if he's a Buddhist. I don't know what he is, but I'm there to visit him because I feel like God told me to go, which that doesn't, whatever. I don't know what's going on right now. And he's sitting next to me, and they're talking in their language. I don't understand anything. But before I got to India, I was on the plane. And I had only read one passage of scripture. It was Mark chapter 4. And it talks about how Jesus was on a boat. He was sleeping on a cushion. And the wind and the waves came. And he got up and he calmed him. And the disciples were freaking out. And that was it. That's the only thing I had read. And I'm sitting there. And the police officer walks out. And I'm sitting with this guy I don't even know. And I'm like, God, I'm going home. I'm going to go home. That's all they want. They don't want me here so I can just go home. I said, I hate to ask you this, but confirm that I'm supposed to be here right now. And this guy puts his hand on my leg, and he goes, hey, man, he goes, you want to hear a story? In my head, I'm like, no. (laughs) We're in jail, dog. Like, no. (laughs) He said, "Uh, I feel like God want me to tell you something. He said, one day Jesus got in a boat, and he was sleeping on a cushion. I was like, no way. I said, bro, I just sat there in my eyes looking at the ground like, for real, God? I mean, how do you, like, be like, oh, that was coincidence? Like, how do you do that? Like, how do you do that? He said, man, he goes, look, I don't know you. I don't know why you're here, but I know that God has a big plan for you. And God wants me to tell you, keep going. Because Satan always wants to bring you back where you came from. He goes, but God wants me to tell you, keep going. I said, well, then I guess I'm going to keep going. (laughs) Like, what do you do? The officer comes in. He goes, yeah. He goes, we're going to go ahead and deport you right now. Get in the back of the police car. We're going to go ahead and take you out. So they take us out. We're sitting next to these guys with machine guns. Dude, I'm from New Orleans. Like, I don't know what's going on, bro. Like, we're eating crawfish back home, and here I am in this jail. Like, what what am I doing with my life, Right? They deport me to this other city. We get to this hotel. They're like in the middle of this festival where they're like pulling chicken heads off and there's blood in the street. Like, it's nuts. It's nuts. And I'm thinking, God, what are you doing? What am I doing here? A miracle happens. I don't have time to go into detail, but paperwork's filed from crazy situation. I'm allowed to go to this village that I was supposed to go see. So I get to the village where I'm supposed to go with this family I don't even know anything about. I'm freaking out, man. I, I've just been through, like, this traumatic experience, right? And I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing here, but I'm here because God told me to be here. I didn't tell them that because I don't know who these people are. But I'm here in this, this house. They give me this, this food that they eat, this village food. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome. So I take this thing that's in it and I bite it. And I'm like, this feels weird. And it's a chicken head, a literal chicken head. I'm like, I am not at home. <laughs> and so my friend goes, hey, bro, uh, we're this guy, he goes, hey, we're going to go to church on Sunday. You want to come? I said, yeah, it'd be great. Let's go to church. He goes, there's this youth service. Um, I don't know if you want to say something. I said, I'd love to say something. I was a youth pastor at the time. I didn't tell him that. I shared my testimony at this event at their little church in this village. We're walking back to the house. He goes, um, are you a Christian? I was like, what? He goes, are you, are you a missionary? And I was like, well, I mean, aren't we all missionaries according to the word of God? Like, you know. <laughs> he said, uh. I said, yeah, bro. I said, yeah, I am. He goes, oh, we are going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> I was like, why, why? He goes, because I'm a Christian and I'm a missionary. I said, what? He said, yeah. The next couple of days, we're going through villages, preaching the gospel. Get back to the house one day, and there's these girls waiting there. And they say, uh, hey, man. Uh, they're talking to my friend in their language. They go, they say, he's translating. He goes, hey, he goes, they want to tell you that they, uh, they went to the service the other night, and they gave their life to the Lord. And they have some friends at their college, and they want you to go talk to them too. You want to go? I said, that's what, yeah, dude, yeah, let's go. He said, all right, cool, they're going to be here tomorrow. They pick us up in this car, we're driving, we're like high five, and this is awesome, praise God. They pull into the police station where I was deported. I'm like, for real? (laughs) 
I can't catch a break. I looked at my friend Dave, and I was like, bro, he's like, don't worry. I, like, don't worry. Just be okay. Just be cool. They get out the car. They lead me down this hallway into this room where all these kids, the police officers' children who deported me in India, all of them, are in a room. They give me the mic, and then let me preach the gospel. These kids get saved. My friend is there on the front row. My, <laughs> my friend is there on the front row, and he's like, oh, I'm so jealous. And I was like, why? He goes, I've lived here my whole life, and this never happens for me. <laughs> Went home, and I thought about my life. I thought about how hard it is to say yes and how easy it is to say no, especially when you don't know what's on the other side. Since that day, um, this family is our family. We're, it's, I mean, we're family. We're brothers. We're friends. Since that time, we've had the privilege to plant four churches in northeast India and two churches in Nepal. I want to show you some pictures really quickly. This is one of the churches that we planted in a village there. And the next picture is, is one of the other churches that we've planted. Everyone who's been saved has come from a Hindu background. The guy who gave his life to the first... His, the first convert of this ministry is now the pastor of these four churches in these villages. We just connected with churches in Nepal. This next picture is the church that's in Nepal that we are connected to, and we're building this network of churches in North India and all around Nepal. This family I live with just relocated their housing and their, their life to a different part of India so that we can minister to five countries around that radius. Man, are you kidding me tonight? Are you joking right now? I'm flying home from this trip, visiting, and I'm thinking, you've marked my life for the ministry. There's no way you walk away from that and don't serve God. <laughs> we have a, a brother in our ministry, his name is Umberto. We had six kids when he started our college ministry in New Orleans, and he was, he was a thug. He agreed to that. He'd sleep when I preach, but whatever. I have a picture of him when we first met him. This is, uh, as you can see, Pitbull in Miami. Cayocho <laughs> pues. So, it's Umberto. Living for the world. He's coming to our ministry. Gives his life to the Lord. Starts to be discipled. He comes up one day, he goes, he's, I mean, he's, he's on track to make tons of money being a barber. He says, uh, he says, man, I, I, I feel like God's telling me that he's got more for me than that. He goes, Stephen, what would you do? And here's the deal. I'm the missions pastor at our church and the young adults pastor. I don't know how you feel about missions, but that's my heart. That's God's heart, man. It's the seeking and saving the lost, not just here, but all around the world. So he's like, I said, you want my opinion? I was like, dude, we got like four mission trips. Uh, you know, that's an option. He goes, well, which one should I go on? I said, if it was me, I'd go on all of them. He goes, done. I said, what? He goes, I'm going on all of them. South Africa, went to Peru. At the end of the year, I had the privilege of leading a trip to Costa Rica. He was on that trip with me. We go to Costa Rica, and it's Sunday morning, and he's been there. He doesn't know what he's doing with his life, what God's called him to do, and we forgot to pray for this service. He goes, hey, can we pray in the corner? I said, yeah. He starts weeping, weeping. I said, okay, Jesus, <laughs> what you doing right now? We get back home. A couple weeks go by. He says, hey, I'm moving to Costa Rica. I'm, getting, I'm, I'm, I'm abandoning this dream, this, this thing with this, this business that I have, and God told me to go, so I'm going to go. The church was only 20 people, only 30 people. He's 26 years old, never went uh, to college, never went to seminary, doesn't have the quote-unquote know-how or the, how to evangelize or how to do all these things. But the pastor at the church that he went to stay with, the pastor had some health issues and had to leave after he got there. As of last week, he is the pastor of our Celebration Church in Costa Rica. I have a picture I want to show you of that ministry that's over there. 20 people. And now the room's so packed, if you can't see the other side of the room, it's out the door. There's no place to sit. Let me tell you something. God doesn't call those who are equipped. He equips the called. God doesn't look for the able. He looks for the available. 
He looks for the man, for the woman whose heart is saying, yes, God, I don't understand what you're telling me to do. I don't know when the moment is. I don't know when the thunder is. But you know what? I'm not going to concern myself with when that moment is because this moment is just as important as that. And you've called me to be faithful steward of the moment that you've given me right now. And some of you are here, you're like, oh, well, that's crazy. That's great for you, pastor. That's great for this guy, Umberto. And I'm not called to missions and all these things. Here's the deal. I don't know what you're called to do, but I know God's plan for you is great. And you're like, will you tell me I need to get on a plane? No, here's the deal. Because you got to do the last thing God told you to do before you look at the hundredth thing he's going to want you to do. For some of you, you, you come here every week, you hear fire preaching, right? It's legit. I mean, God is working in this place. There's conviction that's settling in. Maybe it's in regards to your relationships. God told you, don't be with that person. That person isn't for you. You're not equally yoked in that relationship, not because they're horrible, they're bad. It's just not for you. It's just not for you. And we come in here, we want to hear a fresh word, we want God to move, but he's not moving. You know why? Because you didn't listen to the last thing he told you to do. Maybe it's your friendships. Harvard just came out with a study to say you are the average of your five closest friends. So if your five closest friends are smoking and drinking and having sex, odds are so are you. If your five closest friends are honoring the Lord, fearing the Lord, growing their relationship with the Lord, probably so are you. God's probably called you to get out of and remove and distance yourself from the friendships like I had to do when I gave my life to the Lord. But you haven't done that, so God isn't speaking the way he used to speak to you. Why? Because you've got to be faithful in the moment that God speaks to you. At the beginning of this message, I, I shared a verse with you. It's out of John chapter 10. I said, Jesus said this, I've come that they may have life abundantly, but I, for, I left out the first part of that verse It says the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Can I tell you tonight that you have an enemy who wants to destroy your life. He's come to kill, steal, and destroy your future, your potential, your dreams, your vision. He's come to take everything away from you. And something my teacher told me when I was little, she said slow obedience is no obedience. Can I tell you what the enemy's tactic is for your life? Because the further that he can distance you from obeying what God told you to do, the less likely you are to do it. There was a girl in a Bible study at my house one time, and I was preaching, and she left. And she left for a while. She came back at the end of the meeting. She said, hey, she goes, I'm really sorry. I had to leave. I said, oh, no worries about it. She goes, no, I need to tell you why I left. I was like 13 years old. I was like, what's up? She goes, well, as we were worshiping, God told me I needed to get rid of the ungodly music in my car. I said, okay. This is back in the days I had CDs. She said, so uh, I knew that if I didn't do it right now and I waited till after the sermon, I wasn't going to do it. She said, so I got up and I left and I emptied all of my CDs into the storm drain in front of your house. (laughs) The next day it rained, everything flooded on our street. I'm just joking, that didn't happen. But (laughs) I go out there and there's worldly CDs in that storm drain. And I said, I learned more tonight from that 13 year old girl than I've ever learned. Because slow obedience is no obedience. Man, can I tell you tonight, I'm about to close, is this. The most dangerous spiritual condition that you can be in, the Bible talks about this, is to have a hard heart. You're like, what what does that mean? Like, is it hard? Like, no. The Bible says, he talks about his people, when they disobeyed him, when they didn't do what he told them to do, their heart grew hard. What that means is that you become numb to the things of God. You become numb. Why do I tell you that tonight? Some of you tonight, you're in here, but you're just like a zombie. You're clapping your hands and you're raising your hands. But man, you ain't heard God's voice in a minute. You're not living for the Lord outside of here. Things aren't like you thought they were going to be and all this different thing. Why? Because your heart's hard. Because the last thing that God told you to do you don't want to do it. Why? Because you don't know what's going to happen next. Can I tell you tonight, I don't know what your future holds, but I know who holds your future. 
And his name is Jesus Christ. And you don't have to worry about what's going to happen after the yes. All you have to do is say yes. You don't have to worry about the thunder. You don't have to worry about the great things that are to come. Why? Because they're going to come. But here's the deal. Are you going to be a good steward of this moment and say yes to Jesus? Man, I don't know anything about you tonight. But I do know that God is speaking to you. And that God has spoken to you. But my question for you tonight is, will you say yes to what God is telling you to do tonight? Will you say yes to doing whatever it is, even though you don't know the outcome? There may be some emotional ties there. Maybe you went a little bit too far in that relationship, and it's going to be really difficult, and you don't want to do that. Maybe you, you've been backsliding, doing all these things. Let me tell you something. Paul, Peter said, Paul said this. He goes, but one thing I do, I don't, I don't forget what's behind, but I strain towards what's ahead. And to what's ahead for you is a yes and an amen to whatever God is calling you to do in your life. I love, there's this prophecy in the book of Ezekiel. It's in Ezekiel chapter 37, and the Lord speaks to Ezekiel, and he brings him among this valley, and there's these dry bones. Do you feel dry tonight? You feel like you lost your Christian muscle? You feel like you're not passionate for the Lord? You're not wanting to serve him with all your might? You're not as, as excited about coming here, excited about discipling people, excited about him as you first were? A valley of dry bones is here, and the Lord speaks to Ezekiel, and he goes, I want you to speak over the dry bones. And Ezekiel begins to speak, and as he begins to speak life, the bones begin to rattle. And it says they begin to get up and they begin to reform themselves. And there's muscle that comes onto those bones. And it says that there was a vast army. And I love this verse tonight. Some of you are like, yeah, Stephen, my heart is hard. I, I don't want to do what God tells me to do. Let me tell you this tonight. This is what the Lord says. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone. And I will give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. Let me tell you something. God wants to give you a gift tonight. And that's a yes spirit. That's a yes spirit. Some of you, you've been living with a no spirit long enough. And you're like, I, but I, don't know how to, I don't know how to shake this. I don't know how to get. You don't got to worry about that. You don't got to worry about that. All you got to say is, I want that new heart. I want that heart that says, yes, Jesus, whatever you want me to do. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it looks like. Some of you, you do know what it looks like tonight. And the reason why things aren't progressing the way they need to progress in your life is because you haven't said yes to the last thing that God told you to do. And I don't know what it is, but I know the Holy Spirit is here, and I know that he's speaking to you tonight, and I know that you know what the yes is tonight. And so, man, I just got, I know there's always two people in the crowd. You either know God or you don't know God. And if you're here tonight and you don't know God, let me tell you, the yes that God is calling from you is the yes to make him the Lord and Savior of your life. The Bible says in Revelation that Jesus stands at the door and he knocks on the door of your heart. Anyone who opens it, he will come in and have fellowship with you. Mom and dad can't open your heart, brother and sister, girlfriend or boyfriend. No, no, no. This is between you and God and your relationship with God. And the yes that God is calling from you tonight is the yes to serve him and to make him the Lord and Savior of your life. I want you to bow your heads with me and close your eyes all over this place with respect for the people that are around you. Don't look around. But let me ask you a question tonight. For any of you who are here tonight, if you've never said yes to Jesus, but you know he's calling you by name tonight. And you want to say yes tonight for the first time, man, just slip your hand in the air. Nobody looking around. No one looking around. As a respect. Thank you. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All over this place. I see you. Hands raised. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up all over this place as a symbol that you hear the Lord speaking to you tonight. You can go ahead and put your hands down right now. I'm just going to ask you right now, I'm going to say a prayer with you. I want you to repeat this prayer after me tonight. You can say, God, I hear you calling me by name tonight. I hear you. And I know my sin has separated me from you. But tonight, I'm admitting that I'm a sinner. And I'm saying, yes, Jesus. I believe that you came and lived on this earth a perfect life. You died on the cross for my sins. And three days later, you rose again. And right now in this moment, for the first time ever, I open the door of my heart. And I say, yes, come and have fellowship with me. I make you the Lord and Savior of my life. 
Put your Holy Spirit in me to lead me and to guide me. I commit to following you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want to let you know something. People just got saved. Can I tell you, heaven got more crowded just now. Man, that second person, you didn't raise your hand. I pray that's because you know the Lord. But here's my question for you tonight. What was the last thing that God told you to do that you have not obeyed because you don't want to do it or because people have talked you out of doing it? What's, what is that thing? Because the reason why God brought you here tonight was to break chains, was to release people who've been in slavery to the no to take hard hearts and replace them with hearts of flesh. I want to actually just to stand in this place tonight all over. We're about to worship God. I ask if our prayer team, if you come up, if our leaders and our interns, if you join me at the front, I'm going to pray for you right now in this moment. But let me tell you something. The reason why I love having prayer counselors at the front is because when you make a move physically, it's a symbol of what just happened spiritually tonight. I want to encourage you. If you're here tonight, you're like, man, that was for me tonight. Come pray with our leaders. We don't need your social security number. We don't know where you live. We don't need that. All you guys say is, hey, pray for me. Pray for me tonight. Don't let Satan say, oh, it ain't a big deal. You just sit there. It's cool. No, no, no. Come pray. Come pray. There's power in prayer. There's power in prayer. And we believe in the power of prayer and so I'm going to pray for you. If that's you, man, just get out of your seat and come. You can kneel at the altar if you want tonight. You can stand at the altar. I don't care what you do. This is between you and the Lord tonight. I don't know what, what God's calling from you tonight, but I know that you know what God's calling from you tonight. And I'm begging you as your brother in Christ who has seen the wonders of what he can do when you say yes. It's hard. It's difficult. But it is so worth it. It is the abundant life. It is the abundant life that God has for you. You were not called to live a normal life. You were not called to come to a building and just raise your hands and go and be normal. You are abnormal in the name of Jesus. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead, guess where he lives? He lives in you. He lives in you. Some of you tonight, there's some heart transplants that are about to happen. If you got to weep, then weep. If you got to yell, then yell. If you need prayer, come and get prayer. God, I thank you for tonight, Father. I thank you for what you are doing in this place, God. I thank you for every single person who's acting in obedience in this moment, Lord God. I thank you for every single heart that is present, Lord God. I thank you for the great plans that you have for every single person here. And Satan, in the name of Jesus, we bind and rebuke you right now and the chains and the bondage that have taken place in the lives of the people here. Satan, as you're trying to sow seeds of this isn't for you, this isn't important, stay put, you go back to where you came from in the name of Jesus. And right now, Father, would you transplant hearts across this place? Would you transplant hearts across this place? Father, tonight as we worship you, would you, as you said in Ezekiel, would a vast army rise up tonight? An army of college and young adults who say, yes, Lord, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the outcome is, but yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and everybody says, let's worship together.
believe right now, Lord, that you're doing things in hearts, Lord, that you are just like that verse that Lord, you're taking hearts that have been hard hearts that have put up a hand to you out of fear, Lord, out of, Lord, it doesn't matter what it's from, Lord, but there, I believe there are hearts in this place, God, that have been distant from you. And tonight, you just want to breathe over this place. You want to take what's been hurt, and you want to heal it, God. You want to take what's seemingly dead, and you want to breathe new life. God, you want to plant new dreams in some hearts. And so we invite you here in our worship to do that, to just breathe.
God, you're good. You're so good, God. God, above every situation, above every circumstance, God, you are good and you're faithful, God. God, we're honored that you're here right now. God, you're not distant. God, you're not sleeping. You're not dead. You're not a dormant God. And you're here. Closer than our breath. God, we're so thankful for who you are. We're so thankful. God, and we, we place things in your hand tonight, God. God, we trust you. We trust you with everything that we have. God, and we say yes. We trust you and we say yes, Jesus. I love you so much, God. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Come on, we're not gonna... 